Part 1, Chapter 16. That's a lie. Part 2, Chapter 16, 2A. So we're getting into this. Uh, specifically a fever. I think I have a fever. That's why I'm going crazy. Uh, that's just a joke. Fever is very high body temperature. Why do we do it? It hurts us. It hurts the others. Uh, the others being pathogens. So in this case, uh, you adjust your heat regulation and your hypothalamus overdoes it and tells your body heat up even hotter. Um, so what does this do? Kind of three main things, okay? High temperatures block iron and zinc release, which are needed by bacteria to grow. So they don't get enough iron and zinc, and as a result, they die. Uh, you know from chemistry that increasing temperature makes reactions and things go faster. Molecules move faster. Uh, so fever increases the speed of tissue repair. That's a good thing. And then lastly, it causes protein denaturation. The proteins both in your body, which is why you feel sick, and the bacterium uh, start to unfold. That's denature. Uh, when they get too hot and then they stop to work. These include enzymes and things that make reactions happen. So fever, uh, helpful for you, bad for the bacteria, although too high of a fever is a problem. To basically say anything over 102, is a problem and you need to go to the hospital. Anything from 102 under is essentially safe. Uh, okay, let's talk about uh, the third line of defense. This is the specific defense of the immune system uh, against the specific or particular antigen. Um, so this type of immunity goes or spreads through the blood all throughout the body. Uh, so we say it's systemic. And it also has the ability to remember what a certain antigen looked like so that when you're exposed again, you can attack it very quickly and uh, it won't get you sick. So two types of uh, specific immunity here include humoral immunity and cellular immunity. Humoral, humoral immunity, which is not funny, uses B cells. Uh, and these are your antibodies um, and also the protein complement system that we talked about last time. Uh, and then the cell cellular immunity, T cells, uh, we also sometimes call cell-mediated immunity, um, and this targets cells and actually physically kills them, um, uh, including those with uh, virus particles inside of them. This is how you target your own cells with viruses in them, uh, with the also help of natural killer cells we saw last time. So what is an antigen exactly? We've, we've talked about this on multiple times now. Um, any type of substance that provokes an immune response. So your own surface proteins we don't call antigens because they are of self and you don't have an immune response. But anything else that causes a, a response you call an antigen. So this includes DNA, carbohydrates, uh, pollen, uh, some fats, any microorgan microorganisms, that kind of thing. So we mentioned self-antigens. We don't really or shouldn't call them antigens, but you can, I guess. Um, your immune system cells shouldn't attack them. And uh, another, other, our cells in another person's body can trigger an immune response because those would be recognized as antigens. Uh, and thus, transplants can become tricky from a donor. And we'll talk about that at the end of this. Now, allergies, many of you have allergies probably to various things. Uh, we believe allergies are caused by haptins, which are little fragments or small parts of antigens that when they combine with your own antigens, create or make a new surface protein that your immune system hasn't recognized. So it's like adding two pieces together. Your body knows what this looks like. It doesn't cause a problem. But when this mer merges with this, it now creates this new protein complex that your immune system has never seen, and you attack it. Um, so it's that protein haptin combination, we believe, that uh, is the primary cause of the allergic response. Um, doo -doo. Okay. Now, let's get to the specific cells of the immune system, and we're going to get fairly complicated now. So we have lymphocytes. They came from hemocytoblasts, which you know in the red bone marrow. Uh, two types of lymphocytes, B cells and T cells. B lymphocytes uh, mature in the bone marrow, B for bone marrow. T lymphocytes mature in the, in the thymus, T for thymus. We also have uh, a group of phagocytes, which we were in, introduced to last time, one of the main ones being macrophages. They come from monocytes and they're found all over the place. Macrophages are the first immune system cell on the scene, um, and they're used as part of the identification process of that antigen. Um, so this is just reviewing kind of where these uh, lymphocytes mature, specifically thymus or bone marrow, and then they're moved off to the lymph nodes. Now, let's focus in on humoral response. Um, 
Again, humoral response uses antibodies. Uh, it must encounter a specific antigen, so you program and form certain lymphocytes specific to that antigen, and they undergo what's called clonal selection. So you have this whole array, this series of all different B cells, and those B cells use or have antibodies that haven't been released. Uh, they're basically bullets waiting to be shot out. And based on what antigen you're, uh, you're exposed to, that antigen will bind to one of those B cells, and that turns on and programs that B cell for clonal selection, meaning you make thousands or millions of copies of that one B cell, many, many, many. That B cell is then going to become a plasma cell, and plasma cells are the actual cell that produces and releases the antibodies, and those antibodies will help to destroy the antigens. Uh, we'll talk in, in a second about how. Um, and these antibodies work for anywhere from four to five days before they're recycled in the system. Not all of these B cells uh, become plasma cells. Some of them stay behind and they become memory B cells. And this is for the secondary humoral response again. So the second time you're exposed to an antigen, um, you already have seen it. You don't have to go through the clonal selection process and reproduce a lot of B cells. There's already a bunch there ready for you and you can attack the pathogen very quickly. Um, you often don't even know you've been infected the second time. So this is showing you specifically, here we have a bunch of different B cells um, with their receptors sticking out, which happen to be antibodies that haven't been released. This antigen binds only to one of these. You see this one specifically. So you're going to do clonal selection on this one and make a bunch of them. Some of them become now plasma cells, which will release the antibodies, and some will stay behind as memory B cells so that on second exposure, you can reproduce very, very quickly uh, a bunch of antibodies. So we already mentioned memory B cells, so here's the first response, the number of antibodies shown, and then they slowly, gradually uh, disappear after four or five days. If you get exposed to the antigen again, you get this very fast, very extreme response, which kills off the pathogen, pathogen quickly. This is that secondary response. You can notice the slope is much more extreme, and also this, the sheer volume, the number of antibodies produced is much, much bigger. Um, okay, now, your, your active immunity, your, your B cells that are attacking with antibodies, uh, you can get those in two different ways, okay? You can acquire them naturally. So what we've described so far is active, uh, naturally acquired immunity. So you get an infection, you're, you come in contact with a pathogen, an antigen, and you mount a response to that specific one, okay? You can also get this uh, passively, specifically from mom. Mom can give you antibodies to fight antigens. So if mom gets sick and mom's breastfeeding the baby, oftentimes the baby won't get sick because mom is passing her antibodies to the baby through the milk. And also if the baby is in the womb instead, then, also, then uh, through the placenta. Two different antibodies going through milk or placenta. And we'll uh, mention those in a second here. You can get antibodies from elsewhere, not from mom and not from your own body. This can be from a vaccine. Uh, this would be active. Active meaning you still have to produce antibodies, but it's not a natural exposure to a pathogen. You're intentionally injecting that into yourself through the form of a vaccine. Or passively, where in a lab they produce a whole crap load of antibodies, and those antibodies are injected into you. And we call these often monoclonal antibodies. Um, antibodies obtained from someone else, uh, artificially acquired. Um, you don't have any memory, okay, because you, don't, you haven't produced memory B cells. Uh, you just take the antibodies and those have been injected. Uh, these are often monoclonal antibodies. They're often used for clinical testing because antibodies bind to certain antigens. You see those uh, in the blood testing that we've done on those cards. The little colored chemicals in each of those circles uh, were monoclonal antibodies uh, produced for a specific antigen. Um, uh, so this is also how pregnancy is diagnosed. When you pee on a stick, there's monoclonal antibodies on the stick. Hopefully you've never had to do that. And the antigens that would be released from the baby if they bind uh, to the antibodies on the stick, then it would show up as positive. Uh, they're not really antigens. It's actually a chemical called HCG, but it's antibodies that bind to HCG, and we'll talk about that later. And then there's treatment for other things like hepatitis and rabies as well. 
Antibodies are also called immunoglobulins, um, and they're soluble proteins that are secreted by B cells, as we mentioned, carried through the blood plasma, and they bind to a specific antigen. Okay, here's what an antibody looks like. Knowing the C and the V and all that are, are not essential, but that's, the, that's basically what it looks like. And the only part of the antibody that changes is this one. This is what's going to bind to the antigen. Um, that's called the variable region because it's changeable. Okay, um, so that's the main thing that what you see. Now there's five different classes of antibodies. Each one does a different thing. IgA is found in breast milk and also uh, mucus. IgE is involved in allergies. Those are two very important ones. IgG is the one that can cross the placental barrier. IgD is probably the most important one in your system because it activates B cells. It works with B cells. Um, and then IgM uses the protein complement system. Complement system uh, helps to recruit, and when these antibodies are bound to an antigen, they activate the complement system to go off and attack this cell. So here I have an antigen. Here's the antibody, uh, IgM, and it recognizes that, um, that this antigen is uh, foreign, basically. It binds, and this combination, when this antibody, IgM, binds, the protein complement system is recruited to this cell, and it starts popping and attacking that cell. Four ways, it's the last one of last thing of part A, four ways that antibodies function. Okay? We've already talked about agglutination before in reference to how our blood testing works, where this antibody binds a bunch of different cells and holds them in place. And this is beneficial for your immune system because here comes Pac-Man and it starts to consume all these big clumps of cells. Imagine you're playing Pac-Man and going through the level and you're having to eat one of those dots at a time. Now imagine you can shoot out antibodies which clump all those food dots together in Pac-Man. And uh, now instead of taking one minute to eat all those things and beat the level, with one big bite, you can consume them all and, and pass the level. Now, this bite that we're describing from Pac-Man is actually from macrophages, uh, phagocytes that engulf and consume things. And it's easier to engulf and consume a big chunk of these at the same time. Uh, neutralization uh, is when these antibodies bind to the surface of the uh, pathogen, to the antigens and um, neutralize it so that this virus now, for example, can't attack and get into the cell because it's covered up with all these blockers, the antibodies. Uh, it also helps to pull things out of solution. We call this precipitation. Um, all these things that were dissolved, these pathogens that were dissolved into solution and more difficult for our immune system to see, we pull them out of solution and make it easier to, to attack. Um, and then lastly, recruiting the protein complement system uh, to create here, in this case, a, a pore using uh, perforins um, so that things can, can now pass in and e explode and kill the cell. Here we call it cell lysis, right? Okay, and on this note, we're going to pick up here in uh, the next part, part B. And I'm out. <laughs>